What's going on, Washington Commanders Nation? It's your boy Rio Robinson back with the latest and greatest on the Rambling with Rio YouTube channel, where we ramble about the Washington Commanders. Today is Sunday, April 28th, and yesterday we reached the conclusion of our favorite NFL pastime of the NFL offseason. The NFL draft concluded all seven rounds, and Washington is being applauded and heralded as one of the better draft class in the entire league. Washington started its draft out at number two, obviously, with Jaden Daniels, quarterback out of LSU. Surprised a lot of folks with our first, second round selection when we took Jerzon, Johnny Newton out of Illinois, defensive tackle. Traded back with Philadelphia, which allowed them to draft Cooper DeGene, the great white hope. And then we moved back. We added a second and we deducted a third round pick. So instead of having three thirds and two seconds, we flipped it, put our game down, flipped it and reversed it. We got three second rounders now, the second of which was Mike Sandra still slot cornerback extraordinaire out of the national champion Michigan Wolverines. Then we went tight end slash H back fullback. Jack of all trades, athletic freak dog, Ben Sinnott out of Kansas State. A guy, when Adam Peters gave him the phone call, said, you remind me of two guys that I know very well from my time in San Francisco. That's Kyle Juszczyk, the fullback, and George Kittle, the tight end. That is very high praise. That shit would probably bring tear to my eyes coming from an NFL GM when I get my draft call. And we closed out. Um, night two of the NFL draft with tackle guard combo. We'll see Brandon Coleman out of TCU. And we closed the third round out with Luke McCaffrey, elite bloodlines, son of Ed, brother of Christian, the best skill player in the league right now. Luke McCaffrey, wide receiver out of Rice. And then we got to day three of the draft where we took Jordan McGee, linebacker out of Temple. I know. You heard me correctly. I said linebacker. That's the sixth addition Washington has made to the linebacker position in the linebacker room here this offseason. Ron Rivera is somewhere punching air with a flabbergasted expression on his face because he did not believe in adding to the linebacker room, despite the fact that him and Jack Del Rio were linebackers. But let's keep it present. Jordan McGee, Temple, linebacker. Dominique Hampton. Safety out of Washington. I think it has him lifted, listed as a free safety. He plays more like a strong safety linebacker hybrid. And we closed out the draft with former Ohio State Buckeye, Notre Dame edge rusher, Javante Jean Baptiste. What a class it was. If you can see the graphic on the screen right now, that is the Kent Lee Platt relative athletic score rubric. And it is the it's pretty much the data that consists of the athletic profiles of these guys when they come to the draft. You know, they account for all things, you know, because size is a trick. They account for size. They pretty much account for all relative data that is taken at the scouting combine. And you see all that green on Washington's. According to Kent Lee Platt, Washington has the highest relative athletic score profile mean of all the teams in the NFL. We want some athletic dogs here. A common retort, a common theme of the draft players that we took this year, four or five of these guys were captains of their team. So we want captains. We want tough guys. We want fast guys. A lot of good 40 times, a lot of good verticals. We're going to get fast, violent football player. Joe Witt told you in his unhinged-ass opening press conference, we want to be violent. Like, speaking on our day three picks, let's start with Jordan McGee. I'll take it from the experts because I'm not going to hold you. Like the Shaq meme, sir, I was not familiar with your game. The linebacker out of Temple. Daniel Jeremiah commented on uh, Daniel Jeremiah and I believe Albert Breer had a little spill about Jordan McGee. Uh, he said his name hasn't come up one time in my talks with GMs and personal directors, which is weird. What am I missing? He's instinctive. He's twitchy and he's tough. And I'm looking at Dane Brugler, his commentary on Jordan McGee, three year starter at Temple, 
McGee was the Mike linebacker and defensive coordinator Everett Withers 425 base scheme. He was a high school quarterback. He fully transitioned to linebacker for the Owls. Wow, that's crazy. Quarterback to linebacker is a dramatic shift. Leading the team in tackles each of the last two seasons and earning a single digit jersey number as a two time captain. Let's talk about that part real quick. For those of you who say, Rio, why do you care so much about numbers? Numbers don't matter. It just, ma listen. For those who grew up playing football and playing sports and that have a little swag on the field, you get what I'm saying when I say numbers matter. Hashtag numbers matter. Put that shit in all caps. For most of our Pop Warner teams, AAU teams, and high school football teams, you put a certain set of numbers on a pedestal and Bama's got to compete. Bama's got to go earn the good numbers like Bill Belichick does in new England. He puts like number 50 on the young guys. He says, go earn your number, nigga. Numbers matter. But let's get back to Jordan McGee. I, that side note, tangent, a little bit of a rant I had to go on, but you know how we do in this channel. It's called rambling with Rio for a reason. Dane Brugler said, Although anticipation isn't a true strength of his game, McGee trusts his eyes and he files to the football once he locks onto his target. However, he feels small working downhill. His take on skills leave a bit to be desired, which is why he projects to be more of a will in the NFL. Overall, McGee's average play strength will stand out versus pro competition, but his athletic range and competitive play style are NFL quality assets. He should be an outstanding special teamer as a rookie while he competes for defensive snaps. When you look at the day three picks, you can't look too hard. You can't look too hard and have too high expectations. But I think this is where it stops for day one contributors in our draft class. Dominique Hampton could too. And the one thing Dominique Hampton and Gene Baptiste have, they're old as hell and experienced as hell. They've played a whole lot of college football. Them dudes was in college before Jaden Daniels, 24 years old. They're ready to go. While their game has not been tapped out yet, I would expect they are ready to play if put in that position, but I would expect a lot of those guys to be special teams contributor and depth pieces at the end of the roster, practice guys, practice squad guys, etc. And it got me thinking. We were talking in a group chat earlier this morning. How many starters do you envision out of Washington's 2024 QB class, I mean, draft class. And by the way, PFF gave Washington its number one draft grade, gave us, gave us an A. Washington had the best draft to PFF. And Next Gen Stats, I was on the Next Gen Stats Twitter page as well. Which team had the best all-around draft by the Next Gen Stats overall draft score? The Commanders drafted a league-high Six players who earned a 75 plus overall draft score. Shout out to it. Every draft pundit expert that you could think. Obviously, getting a high draft grade the day after you selected players does not result directly into anything. It's not going to win you games on Sunday, but you can definitely sense the tide turning here. They're seeing that this is not the same Washington. And let's talk about like how many of these rookies can start immediately so let's go to the top of the class let's let's start with the quarterback Jaden Daniels he's going to start day one he's going to start week one we've been told throughout the entire draft process this is the most NFL ready guy of the group 55 career starts he's progressed a little bit more each season I don't want to talk too much about Jaden in this video because I'm going to give him his own isolated breakdown of our selection at number two because I wasn't able to give a Jaden Daniels video because I was so damn busy streaming for five hours getting home getting out of recap hanging with the boys and getting ready for draft day two Expect tomorrow a full-length Jaden Daniels era has begun video in Washington. Let's call a spade a spade. Jaden Daniels is going to start. Let's move on to 36. Johnny Newton. I don't expect him to start, but I expect him to play snaps like a starter. What does that mean? If we come out in base, I expect to see Payne and Allen on the field. 
but I expect us to rotate so frequently that Johnny Newton is getting snaps as if he's a full-time starter and they can move him around. He could play from a multitude of spots. So I'll say no for Johnny Newton, but put an asterisk next to his name because he's going to be a quasi starter. And I will stand on it when I say, I think that's the most gifted pass rusher we have at the defensive tackle position. I love Payne, love Allen. I think it's close with Payne and Newton, but Johnny Newton knows how to get to a quarterback. Can't wait to see us run a 3-4 front where we got Jerzon, Johnny Newton, and Allen on the ends, and Payne lined up over the center. Very excited to see what that looks like. So starter, Daniels, quasi-starter, Johnny Newton, but not really. Mike Sandra still, you can put it in ink, Sharpie, whatever permanent fixture you want to put it in. Mike Sandra still is the starting star slash slot slash Nick, whatever you want to call it. He's the, he's the inside corner on this team. Got it. Doesn't have to compete for it. It's his day one. And when he steps into the building tomorrow, I need him to request number zero and whatever he has to do to challenge Marcus Mariota for that number, he needs to have it because a starter should have priority when it comes to elite numbers. Going back to my number conversation from earlier because hashtag numbers matter. Moving on to Ben Sinnott. Similar to Johnny Newton, I don't expect Ben Sinnott to be a day one starter, but I expect him to be on the field all the time, whether that's in the pistol lined up as a fullback whether that's spelling Zach Ertz as the tight end, whether that's a two tight end set with Ertz and Ben Sinnott on the field at the same time, we're going to see a whole hell of a lot out of Ben Sinnott. We're going to see much more Ben Sinnott than we saw Cole Turner. They made a priority of drafting this guy. There's a reason why they took him in the second round, made him the second tight end off the board. We set a president. They have a plan for this guy. High praise to say, he reminds me of Kyle Juszczyk and George Kittle. George Kittle's a top three tight end in the NFL. Kyle Juszczyk is the only relevant fullback in the NFL. Heavy praise. And for some people, they've thrown out the Chris Cooley comparisons for Ben Sennett. If he's that, we got us one of them ones. Might as well throw him number 47 while we're at it. Just kidding. Don't wear number 47. That's a nasty number. Get a number in the teens or a number that starts with eight, my boy. You've heard it here first, but he definitely looks like a guy. He wore number 34 in college, looking like the most elite fullback in the world out here, looking like Shaquille O'Neal on the football field. But I don't think Ben Sinnott starts, but I think he gets a whole lot of action. Moving on to our first O-lineman, Brandon Coleman out of TCU. Everybody in the chat, everybody in the group chat, in the comments and on Twitter, is saying, Rio, go back to his 2022 tape. This is a left tackle. I, for whatever reason, my eyes see guard. My guys see the movement of a guard, but he does do tackle-like things. Go look at him in the national championship versus Georgia, though. He held it down as a tackle. But for whatever reason it is, I don't know if it's that he's just wide-backed as hell I don't know if it's the neck roll. He, people say he's built like Teron Smith, but there's something about him. Don't give me Teron Smith. That boy biggest. I don't know. I just see guard. His feet just look slow, but somehow he ran under a 540. So he's technically an athletic tackle. I'll believe it when I see it, but I could see him being a really good guard in this league. I would love to see how he handles NFL edges when they start him off at tackle. We're going to know very soon in the OTA mini camp, mandatory mini camp sessions of the offseason, whether Brandon Coleman's going to be a tackle or a guard. Because we knew before the summer got here that Brandon Sheriff was not going to be a tackle. That shit ended fat. Jay Gruden got him the hell off of the tackle position almost immediately. And that's when we got the first infamous guard from Jay Gruden. I think Brandon Coleman is going to be a fine guard. Most think he's going to be a tackle. I would love to be wrong because we did not do anything about the left tackle position if it ain't him. And I'm looking at the current list of available tackles this offseason. Not the prettiest thing, but there's definitely some guys still out there and available for Washington. Donovan Smith, 
AJ Jackson, David Bakhtiari, which I, I'm not sure because he had he has like one good leg on him. DJ Humphreys, who's not going to be available for the start of the season. Andres Peep. I think I'm willing to take a flyer on the mountain of a man known as Makai Becton. Old ass Jason Peters, Charles Leno, not happening. Jerron Christian, not happening. Chris Hubbard, Billy Turner, Cameron Irvin, Dwayne Brown, Riley Reef. Those are the veteran alternatives if Brandon Coleman does not end up solidifying and putting a stranglehold over the left tackle position here in DC. And my last guy, I'm going to pencil in as a starter here in Washington is Luke McCaffrey, LMC, son of Ed, brother of Christian, Rice Al, former Nebraska starting quarterback turned wide receiver. We're hearing a lot of Puka Nakua comps for Luke McCaffrey. I can believe it. Ed McCaffrey has taught those boys well. I trust the genetics. I trust the bloodline. And I trust what the tape told me. He caught 13 touchdowns last year. He's going to eat all, he's going to eat across the middle. He's going to be one of Jaden Daniels' best friends on crosser routes. We're going to really see if Jaden can throw the ball across. Man, we know if Jaden can throw the ball across the middle, but he didn't do it much. He was not asked to do it much at LSU. I'm penciling Luke McCaffrey in as a starter. The top three receivers on the roster, Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, and Luke McCaffrey. Luke McCaffrey has size, but he could be a big slot, or you can start him on the outside. It depends how Cliff feels about Jahan Dotson. Does Cliff see what we see and see a guy that should be in the slot? Or is Luke McCaffrey, who's the natural slot, going to be the inside guy while Jahan stays on the outside? I just hope Cliff can Cliff can find it within Jahan because he let me down so bad last year. Like, you could blame EB Sam Howe, but no, if you watch him, you watch the body language, and you watch how he really couldn't get off press man for the majority of the season, you could see how he was taking himself out of games last year. It wasn't even just the defense. like. It was a him problem, but he's speaking up real heavy, like one of the ambassadors of the team this offseason. I've been seeing a lot of Jahan Dotson clips, excerpts going around. Maybe he sees the vision and maybe he's ready to take a year three leap. But I definitely see Luke McCaffrey as the third starting receiver on this team, whether it be outside or the inside will be up to Cliff Kingsbury. Our three receiver set to start it all off is going to be Terry, Han and Luke McCaffrey. Don't think Hampton, uh, McGee, or Gene Baptiste will be any type of starter. We have guys at all of their positions, but I do appreciate Washington's aggressive nature at attacking the linebacker position this year. It's something I'm not used to seeing here in Washington, man. But when it comes to Luke McCaffrey, though, just to jump back to him one more time, he holds the PFF college record for career contested catch rate. If you lower the threshold to a minimum of under 30, here are three of the only 12 wide receivers ranking ahead of him. Nico Collins, Jacoby Myers, and Puka Nakua with a 63, 62, and 61.8%. Luke McCaffrey is the next up with Luke with, with 61.5%. That's a starting NFL receiver. No, we're not saying he's Puka or he has to be Puka. He's faster than Puka. He's definitely faster, has a better athletic profile than Puka. If another team can make a guy like Puka Nakua get busy in his first year, we could put Luke McCaffrey right up in here, plug and play. Let's roll. Jaden Daniels is going to get the ball to all these guys. And I'm very interested to see rookie minicamp. Like, I'm ready. The NFL draft ending is such a weird feeling because it's exciting because you're like, oh, shit, the schedule is going to come out in the next couple weeks. Rookie minicamp, OTAs, and then mandatory minicamp before training camp gets underway in July. But the draft is like the last gas, the last wind of the offseason. It's like it all comes crashing down. It's like that week between – Christmas and New Year's, but it's way longer. Like there becomes like a significant dry period until shit gets real again. But my main three themes of the 2024 draft, when I look at it, when I look at how Chef Adam Peters and Lance Newmark cooked it up, number one, they don't care about general consensus. They don't care about any of our 100,000 mock drafts or any of our Twitter GM expertise when it comes to picking players. 
They did not force target players at positions of need. Very heavy BPA. And they didn't target a tackle as earlier as we expected. Also, they didn't do a lot of moving. They moved one time with an arch nemesis. Like, why not do a deal with them? Adam Peters, we have on the wall right now, anywhere, anybody, anytime. Anyone can get it. We'll do business wherever we got to do business to, for the betterment of the team. We did business with the ops. We let them pair Quinion Mitchell with Cooper DeGene, but we got three picks in the second round. We came away from that thing with a D tackle, a corner, and a tackle. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm cool with what we did, man. I mean, and a tight end. I'm cool with how we attacked the draft. BPA, relative athletic score was a clear focus. Lance Newmark was talking in his post-draft presser that they tag guys as commanders that fit a certain athletic or they fit a certain profile from a character, athletic, and on-field standpoint. You know what I hear when I hear that? I hear identity. Not culture. I hear identity. This draft, this offseason in general, is to establish an identity. We have had a incessant identity crisis for the majority of the last 25 years. I don't think we've ever had an identity during my time of fandom here for this team. Then you look at teams like the Ravens. Look at how the Ravens handle free agency in the draft every year. Every pick they make, you look at it, you look at the value of it, and you say, that makes sense. That's a Ravens guy. What's a Redskins guy? What's a football team guy? What's a commander's guy? I don't know. It's just like we're throwing shit at the wall over the years. It seems like we're finally trying to identify a certain type of guy, and they're tagging them as commander. I love that shit. I love that shit. And just like when Adam Peters was in San Francisco, Lance Newmark took the post-draft presser. Adam Peters always conducted the post-draft press conference and not John Lynch when he was there in San Francisco 49er. So we're bringing even more traditions to the DMV from San Francisco. It wasn't just top golf. And a way to put a bow on the draft class, the team's social media put hell of a draft class. Now off the top goal. Love it. I love petulance. I thrive off negativity and I love petulance. I love it. Lean into that shit. The top golf boys are ready to go in 2024. And we did not stop at just draft picks. We signed a bunch of undrafted free agents as well. As soon as the draft finished, Washington was on the phones bringing guys in. And that undrafted free agent draft class is led by the most handsome man in the league, Jimmy G East, Jimmy Jesus of Nazareth, Sam Hartman out of Notre Dame. Hide the women, hide your wives. Sam Hartman is in town now, and they gave him the most guaranteed money of all of the undrafted free agents thus far, which really makes me feel like Jake Fromm's time in D.C., that boy may be cooked. That boy may be cooked, cooked, y'all. I'm just saying. 225000 gave him a $25,000 sign-in bonus. Sam Hartman leads Washington's undrafted free agent class. Also, running back Austin Jones out of USC. Cliff Kingsbury should know who he is because he was in that building last year. Cornerback A.J. Woods out of Pitt. Safety Tyler Owens out of Texas Tech. That's the one I have circled because I don't think we have a naturally fluid center fielder, sideline to sideline, free safety on the roster. Tyler Owens is a big ass safety with a 10.00 relative athletic score. That is a freaky guy. Everything on his RAS score is green. His size, 6'2, 215, 43540 with a 1-5 split. A 693 cone and a 415 shuttle, 41 inch vertical, 12 inch, 12 foot broad. This is a 6'2, 250 pound safety moving like that. That is the one I have circled. The other one I have circled, we have a tackle. I'm going to try my best to say this last name, but I'm sure that's going to go to hell real fast. Out of Toledo, we took tackle 
David Wagoo That sound like dude who tried to say Aurora on the draft the other day. Luke Aurora from the Falcons. We took the defensive tackle from Virginia Tech, Norrell Pollard, running back Michael Wiley out of Arizona. Wide receiver from Georgia, Marcus Rosamy Jack Saint has size. They say he's just a guy you put out there and he's ready to go. Um, Jordan Reed said about Markami Rosamy Jack Saint, he just simply does his job. He's only had two drops in four years. This is was his answer when someone asked, Who's the best combo of route runner and run blocker? That was his answer about Marcus Rosamy Jack Saint. Safety, Ben Nickel, Iowa State, cornerback Chigozi Anusium out of Colorado State. We signed a bunch of undrafted free agents on top of the draft class we already had. How would you guys rate the draft? I'm going to give us an A minus. An A minus and a B plus are the same grade, but the optics look different. Like A minus. Is has A in front of the minus and B plus has B in front of the plus. They're the exact same grade, but one looks better. I'm leaning toward the A minus because first things first, Washington now has a potential franchise quarterback, a position we've tried to solve so many times in our lives. I think we are set up for the first time to actually put a foundation and ecosystem around a guy, but I think we got four possible day one starters. We got athletes for days. We got hella team captains. And most importantly, when you look at this draft class, nothing stands out like a sore thumb. There were hella picks that stood out like a sore thumb every time Jack and um, Ron and company drafted here, whether that was Fedarian Mathis or Braden Daniels. Some guys just didn't look like guys, bro. They just didn't look like they were going to pan out in the league. Like you just went into it with a bad feeling before you even watch this guy put a helmet or a practice jersey on. I don't see that when I look at this. Day three, obviously those guys aren't probably going to be expected to be on the field for more than a special team's capacity. But I look at this class and I see guys. We know all the guys we took on night one and two. Those are all familiar names. And for most people that follow, follow college football, we know most of these names. But on day three, didn't know any of these Bamas when they said their name for the first time. I watched a lot of Washington, so I knew Dominique Hampton existed. Never said his name in my life before we drafted him, and I'm totally fine with that. What we can't do as fans is because we don't know a player or because we're not familiar with a player's game or skill set is Judge Adam Peters for taking him. They're getting paid the big bucks to do that. They're getting paid to have scouts and scouts work 365 days a year and crunch tape every day of the week for months, possibly a year to get ready for draft night. And to close this out, my favorite thing I've heard coming out of Ashburn is that Adam Peters does this process a day before the draft where he has all the scouts and all the people in the front office coaching staff, all the people in the room, he has them stand up and list the name of players they hope we come away with draft weekend. That's how he builds a consensus, collaboration, recalibration, lockstep. Washington is putting together their aligned vision of how things are going to go here in D.C., and Adam Peters is at the forefront of the build. Him and Dan Quinn seem to be getting along, but this is the honeymoon phase. Is it going to be able to last once shit gets real? Go into the season with high hopes. Temper your expectations. Realize this is a young football team. We are going to have over 10 new starters this year. We're going to have a few rookies starting. Our quarterback is a 23-year-old rookie who hasn't started one NFL game. Cliff Kingsbury, Dan Quinn, Joe Witt. This is all of their first time for the most part working together. New staff, new front office, new ownership, new everything. So what we need to do in year one is establish an identity and look competitive. And we need to see our quarterback develop on schedule. Stop talking about playoffs. Stop talking about being Houston. Let those things happen if they're going to happen organically. Temper your expectations. Don't go in with high hopes so that if the season ends in a 6-11 and 11 type year, 
you're not mad at the end of the season because that's okay. It's year one. As long as we don't go like two and 15, three and 14, four and three, as long as we win more than four games, progress has already been had. It's more about the eye test, the things you don't see, the things that are happening behind the scenes. Are they progressing on schedule? Is the quarterback taking strides or does he look lost? He's going to go through his growing pains. It's not going to be pretty all year. It didn't start pretty for C.J. Stroud. It took about a month into the season for him to really start hitting the ground running. Know these things going into the season. While we want Jaden as a 23-year-old starter to just absolutely come out guns blazing, all situations are different. But I think Washington is set up for actual success. And hopefully this is the start to something beautiful here during the Adam Peters, Dan Quinn era of Washington football. This is the most genuinely excited I've felt in quite some time. And without that idiot dweeb sitting atop the organization, all possibilities are now on the table. This is your 2024 Washington Commanders draft class, the inaugural draft class of Adam Peters. Let's cook Chef Peters. Washington Commanders fans, let's show up. Let's show out. Let's let them cook. Let's let them get it together and let's let them develop. That's all I got for right now. Until next time, hail to the Washington Commanders. Commander Rio, out.